what better way is there to prosper and carry on our traditions and culture than empowering our women? Women should not be the entrusted and passive guardian of culture under the shadow of the male or state gaze. They should be the creators, active carrier custodians and transmitters of culture, and they should be given a platform to express their views. This is Uyghur Stories. Stories from the Uyghur Diaspora. Hi, John. How are you? Hi. Hi, Mukadas. I'm good. Thanks. It's so nice to be back with you here at the podcast after a little bit of a break. Yeah, we had a um, two month of break. I don't remember. One month of break. No, maybe not quite that long. Yeah. We won't we, we won't worry about it too much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it was a, a nice little chance to make some progress on some other projects. And mm-hmm. but I'm really excited to to be back here with you and to be uh, working on another really important episode. Yeah, it's true. It's a really important issue, really important episode that we will start discussing about today because when we started having this idea of having this uh, Uyghur Stories podcast, I wanted to tackle some issues that never been really um, discussed in, in Uyghur community. So the this one is one of these kind of uh, topics um, which is really, I think, very urgent and important to um, to discuss and, and hear some people's thoughts on on this kind of topics. So I'm excited to um, share this this conversation that I had with someone and we will we will tell who is that person um, about specifically Uyghur women and um, um, women's place in Uyghur society, but not only in Uyghur society, but in um, in Chinese um, environment and um, uh, how uh, Uyghur women, some challenges that Uyghur women were facing since many um, decades um, within this kind of very harsh political environment. So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk with you about this because, um, you know, this is really a chance for me to learn about a different, but very important part of the Uyghur experience. And especially as somebody outside of the community, outside of the diaspora, this is something that I feel like um, it's very hard for me to get information about or to understand better. And um, so I'm really, um, you know, sort of honored to be included in this part of the conversation and uh, am really excited to to hear more about um this uh this conversation that you had with our guest today can you tell us a little bit more about the guest today sure um she's a uyghur female researcher living in europe who'd like to keep her identity anonymous so as to protect her family but she wanted to contribute and she wanted to discuss these issues because she thinks that women's place and women's right a women's issue is not something that we should wait for every problems to resolve yeah thank you very much to this person for for uh agreeing to participate in this episode and you know i think it speaks to um not only the sort of the the many kinds of concerns that people living in the diaspora have to deal with but also the the bravery that exists in the diaspora that sort of despite these extraordinary circumstances um this person really wants to have this conversation have this conversation in a public forum and um and uh you know is is willing to do that and so uh, we just want to say thank you to this person for providing her thoughts and um we're really excited to share this conversation with you now so john do you want to explain how we recorded this episode Yes, sure. So um, because our guest uh, wanted to remain anonymous, what we did was we submitted questions to her in writing, and she responded in writing. And then we had Mukadas record a conversation using her answers as a script with an actor. And that is what you will hear today. 
I want to start by asking you about gender roles.、Um, what kind of gender roles, and specifically roles for women, would you consider traditional in Uyghur society? What kind of pressure exists on Uyghur women to conform to those traditional roles today?、Mm, yeah,、um, gender roles in Uyghur society are broadly comparable to those in many other traditional societies. People generally carry certain beliefs about gender-bound responsibilities and behaviors that are deemed appropriate and acceptable.、Um, in general, traditional views hold that a woman's role should be caretaker at home, which is to nurture her children physically and emotionally, care for her husband, her parents, and in-laws. A man's role is very much to provide financial support as the breadwinner. And be the pillar and protector of his family. This is,、uh, of course, is derived from the recognition that women are born ajis, that is physically weak, therefore need to be protected by the male figures in the household. However, things are not that clearly demarcated. I think this question needs to be looked at from the cultural, historical, and also. Political milieu that Uyghur women have been subjected to. So let's. Get、uh, into this question and、um, look at it in more precise way. Yes,、um, the the breadwinner image of a man is certainly dubious. In the countryside, women work as much as men do in the field on most occasions. In urban settings, Uyghur women are often wage earners, just like their husbands. Unlike many women in majority Muslim. Muslim societies, Uyghur women's engagement in trading activities, be it on a big or small scale, is also not frowned upon by the public or society. Therefore, many women are successful traders. Women also work as professionals, public servants, and in factory production lines. Many Uyghur women,、uh, especially in peri-urban or rural areas, would often grow up learning craftsmanship and skills such as embroidery. Carpet weaving and dressmaking, so it is not uncommon for women to engage in domestic manufacturing that could substantially contribute to family income. In that sense, most Uyghur women naturally struggle with what is expected from them because they have to carry the double burden in order to fulfill not only their domestic role that is expected by traditional notions, but also integrate into the labor force in the public sphere, which is expected by the state. The latter is carried out in the guise of Chinese-style gender equality, which was first propagated by Mao, saying, "Women hold up half the sky." The thing is, in China, gender equality by engaging women in the workforce has never been achieved in any meaningful way. Gender discrimination and domestic violence are rampant because there is no clear legal framework to protect women's rights. According to research, up until seven or eight years ago, China is the only country in the world where female suicide rates are higher than those for males. I just note that these statistics do not include ethnic minorities, and that the research was carried out amongst the Han Chinese.、Uh, Weaker women are, of course, part of this political institution, just like the Han Chinese women. So, whatever the brunt that the Chinese women carry when it comes to the clash of traditions. And women's rights, Uyghur women face the same issue, but only more, and that is because Uyghur women ha- also have to confront the rampant, racially driven gender stereotypes in the public domain. The state often exploits Uyghur women's body, labor, and even phys-、uh, physical image for political purposes. So I would say most Uyghur women do not have much autonomy in deciding their domestic and public roles that they feel comfortable playing. And Uyghur women's questions should be examined from、um, an intersectional perspective. Yeah, I remember gr- growing up, meeting with some Han Chinese from Beijing or from Shanghai, and the first thing that they would say to me as a 
Uyghur woman is like, oh, you're 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 a dancer, or you can dance, and you have beautiful dresses. So that was like how Uyghur women is, um, you know, like portrayed or like defined in in Chinese society. Yeah, it also sounds like the romanticization of of a traditional culture too. Mm-hmm. That it's like almost a Mm-hmm. like a tourism thing yeah you know? so in your experience do these sorts of traditional ideas about gender equality exist in the Uyghur diaspora in the same way that they do in Uyghur homeland I'd say to some extent yes especially with the first generation Uyghur diaspora community and uh, this is particularly true for those who left the Uyghur land in the 1980s when they took advantage of China's open door policy and migrated overseas for educational purposes or economic mobility. Most women from this generation often exercise more independent behavior when it comes to education, work, and entertainment, but largely retained uh, traditional responsibility for housework and child rearing. The younger generations who migrated in the past two decades often left their homeland with disillusionment to any betterment in their future and scarred by rampant discrimination they faced in China. Uh, Therefore, the current crisis exacerbated the sense of urgency in clinging on to what is considered traditions, including gender roles, to keep the Uyghur culture alive. I am in no way suggesting that these ideas have not been challenged in form or essence, not at all. They are emerging, there are emerging feminists, LGBTQI rights advocates in all gender categories that are debating and championing for gender equality. Um, it is forming a formidable force, although um, not mainstream yet, but still very welcome. And I'd say I'd say a nascent feminist movement is in the making. This is particularly strengthened by the second generation Uyghur migrants in Europe, America, and Australia. They grow up being exposed to feminist ideals, and they are reshaping the concepts of gender roles within diasporic Uyghur communities. Yeah, it's true. I have been encountering with very uh, lots of very brave women um, while I'm working or talking to people or traveling and there are ma- many brave young Uyghur women are speaking out and, um, and um, they're not afraid of sharing their ideas and their way of um, seeing the world and also their way of being a woman in this um, particular time. So can you give us um, an example of someone who who's like, exemplar in in this um, feministic leadership in the diaspora? Yes, absolutely. For one example, uh, one prominent figure is Pezilet Ismail Jan, a hijab-clad young Uyghur student who, at the age of 17, co-founded the Feminist Party of Finland and was elected as vice president of the party at the age of 18 in 2017. Yeah, there are quite um, few... Um, impressive young Uyghur women and it's really something to um, be proud of so I wanted to I want us to go further in the in our conversation so in what ways does this kind of gender-based inequality prevent Uyghur society from keeping up with global trends towards increased gender equality what do you think are the impacts of theirs on the Uyghur community today? This is a very good question, but one which, again, should not be answered in isolation. It is an extremely challenging time to carry the combined identities of Uyghur, Asian, and Muslim anywhere in the world. And I must emphasize that being a Uyghur does not naturally translate into being Muslim. Yes, it's really, really important. Please go ahead and share more. (laughs) Yes, some argue that if we had not been subjected to such a level of persecution in our homeland, and had we managed everything with our own hands, we would have had the time and opportunities to tackle gender inequality and keep up with the global trend. Yet now, since our physical and cultural survival has to be the top priority, it is not time to talk about the 
less important issues such as gender equality or domestic violence or discriminations against LGBTQI groups. I'm afraid I have to disagree with this line of argument. Yes, we are being ruthlessly oppressed and millions of us are deprived of voice and agency to make changes and progress from within. But this does not mean that until the time comes when we proudly stand up against the Chinese government's brutality, those issues are minor and do not warrant attention. There has never been a better time to tackle gender inequality. Meanwhile, Uyghur men should be ready to be educated in and learn about matters that are related to gender equality. Many Uyghur women like yourself, Mukadas, as well as Yi Xiaotuo, Rehan Aset and Humar, for example, who are actually first generation migrants, are the very embodiment of feminist ideals and voice. Uyghur women in diaspora are finding creative ways to bravely share their stories and empower their counterparts in general, whilst at the same time advocating for gender equality. Instead of taking on these things as contradictory forces, they should be considered complementary. There are also so many women in the diaspora who might not be able to speak out or use their voice in the same way. And also the pressure is so high, as we discussed. And um, recently I, 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 I have been very um, disappointed on, on some uh, Uyghur men who allowed themselves on, on social media and uh, making some kind of videos um, asking Uyghur women to behave in this or that or that way or not behave in that way uh, in order to, you know, like carry on Uyghur culture or Uyghur identity. And they're like never asked themselves if they're that their place to speak in the name of Uyghur women. So that was really um uh, outraging and it was really um, hard to hear from Uyghur men to like be like uh, mansplaining all the Uyghurs and speak speaking on their behalf so yeah and um, that's something that really needs to mm. be addressed yeah I can of course appreciate the reluctance shared by some members of the community to speak up against issues um, like mm. domestic violence in their adopted country especially in the west um, by discussing the problems in our community, especially domestic abuse or gender discrimination, we are fearful that we will be feeding the harmful stereotypes attached to migrants and particularly Muslim communities. Uh, sometimes this might even be used by the sympathizers of the Chinese government's policies towards the non-Han peoples in Xinjiang to justify the state's active efforts to erase our culture and traditions. But we shouldn't give way to racism, Islamophobia, and victim blaming. Such a situation has been endured, for example, by African American communities, indigenous communities in Australia, and general Muslim migrant communities in the West. We need to engage and critique patriarchy, stand tall against violence towards women and the queer community, we should allow ourselves to be angry, to grieve and fight the Chinese state's violence against us. But there is no reason why the matter of gender equality shouldn't go hand in hand. A tolerant and united Uyghur community is deemed to become an even more formidable force against state tyranny. Uh, culture and traditions weaken with gender discrimination. And what better way is there to prosper and carry on our traditions and culture than empowering our women? Women should not be the entrusted and passive guardian of culture under the shadow of the male or state gaze. They should be the creators, active carrier, custodians, and transmitters of culture, and they should be given a platform to express their views. I cannot agree more with what you just said. Um... Within China and within the Uyghur homeland, how have women been impacted by Chinese government policies such as forced marriages, forced um, really relocations, and even forced sterilizations? Could you please um, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more 
um, mm-hmm. your research on that? There have always been gendered dynamics to the Chinese government's oppression towards the Uyghurs, especially when it comes to implementing staged assimilationist policies. It is not unique, however, that in the most authoritarian or racist regimes and at times of war and racially or ethnically driven conflicts, women and children are often one of the critical targets of the state-sanctioned violence. And they are at the receiving end of coercive policies centered around their dress code, body, and reproduction rights. The forced marriage of Uyghur women to Han Chinese men is nothing new. In the 1950s and 60s, when the paramilitary Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps were expanding, mass migration of Han Chinese young men to the southern part of the Uyghur homeland meant that the sex ratio of the newly arrived migrants who were primarily single was unbalanced. To that end, the government implemented cash or material goods as rewards for inter-ethnic marriage. For example, in the Hotan region, young Uyghur girls, especially from the downtrodden families or unfavorable class backgrounds were lured or coerced into marrying Han men. This happened again in the aftermath of the July 5th Urumqi incident in 2009, when the Chinese government strengthened and accelerated its sinicization effort. Local government posters and newspaper articles openly advocated for mixed marriages, which would reward the actions with cash or preferential policies directed at the offspring's future education, for instance. Amid the current crisis, forced marriage is one of the policy focuses. One prominent feature is that in these alliances, it is near unanimous that it is always a Han man marrying a Uyghur woman. State-sanctioned visual propaganda explicitly emphasizes the availability of young, beautiful, virtuous Uyghur women and encourages Han men to go to the Uyghur land and woo them. This hyper-sexualized, exoticized stereotype of Uyghur women is nothing new. It has been perpetuating Chinese social media, as well as state and popular culture narratives for decades. Han men in privileged ethnic and social political positions marrying women from the persecuted group contesting society and territory is uh, is a textbook demonstration of imperial power relations. State-sponsored commodification and exploitation of women's body and sexual violence against Uyghur women, which is bounded by the legal document, is in fact, or in effect, systematic rape. It inflicts prolonged terror, pain, and humiliation, and it is the key policy means to assimilation by force and coercion. One other means of state controlling women's body is, of course, the credible report of forced sterilization of Uyghur women of childbearing age, and forced insertion of IUDs into women's bodies indefinitely. One topic often comes up when discussing the Chinese state's so-called preferential policies towards Uyghurs. The argument is, while the Han Chinese women could only have one child for nearly four decades, Uyghurs were mercifully allowed two. Hence, in the eyes of the sympathizers towards China's policies in Uyghur land, what is there to complain about? (laughs) For them, policies such as forced sterilization of Uyghur women while encouraging Han women to have three children are rational, that Uyghurs have had their time already. This blatantly simplistic and, to be quite honest, anti-women view entirely disregards the fact that in this particular instance, be it Han, Uyghur, or other women from any ethnic background in China, they have been wholly deprived of autonomy over their body and that there shouldn't be ethnic or racial boundaries when it comes to women's oppression by the state by taking control over their body for its political agenda. If the one-child policy in its rhetoric was to help lift China out of poverty by controlling population growth, the forced birth control directed at Uyghurs is a conscious and active method to drastically alter population size and ultimately reach the goal of sinicization of the entire nation. And, of course, this process is to be exacerbated by forced marriage of Uyghur women to Han men. 
As for the forced relocation of Uyghur women as cheap or slave labor, this is again the continuation of an old policy. As early as the turn of the century, young Uyghur women aged between 16 to 22, some still children, were transferred to China proper, thousands of miles away from their home to work in factories. They were considered as sheng yu lao dong li, which translates into extra labor force. The rationale given by the state is that after dropping out from high school education and before marriage, these young women became stay-at-home labor force who had nothing to do and contributed nothing to family income. Hence, it is better to transfer them to big factories to earn money so that they could send back remittances. Most of these young women's parents were coerced into agreeing to send their children away. Village heads were given quotas to fill in recruiting girls as part of their work tasks. Information given to the parents was scarce and opaque. The state media constantly reported on the scenes of young girls dressed in uniform boarding huge, long-distance passenger buses to be transferred from their home village to the capital city, Urumqi, and then to China proper, and then to China proper cities by train. They'd be photographed happily operating in factory lines and enjoying dormitory life within the compound of factories, happy Uyghur women earning big money in Chinese cities, opening their eyes to the outside world and sending big money home became frequent media obsession to yet again demonstrate the state's paternalistic care. This is another, um, this is also another case, another case in point where Uyghur women are not viewed as a creative force that are capable of bettering their conditions and move towards change. Rather, they are considered to be oppressed internally by their backward, stagnant, and repressive traditions and culture. Hence, they need to be helped and saved. In fact, most of these village girls contribute to family economy by working in the fields, participating in commercial activities, and engaging in hand craftsmanship. In the first few years of transferring the Uyghur labor force to China proper, the state mainly targeted young women. This augmented Uyghur's doubts as to the reason behind this gender-specific effort. Although starting from 2005 to 2006, young boys were also recruited. The proportion of women is still much higher. Uh, General Uyghur's public's grievances on the forced allocation of young girls to Chinese cities was already on the rise when Chinese co-workers killed young Uyghur factory workers in the city of Xiaogong in July 2009. This led to young Uyghurs, including university students, peacefully protesting in the city of Romchi, asking the government to handle the situation and to bring the culprits to justice. Unfortunately, Uyghurs' initial, initial peaceful protest was brutally crushed by the armed forces, and it became an ugly clash between Uyghur and Han civilians. That scar has never fully healed. What is happening now is that the Chinese government is simply continuing this policy by dislocating both Uyghur men and women as cheap labor to Chinese cities. They are not mass transported there for social or economic mobilities. They do not have the freedom to choose their work hours. They do not have the freedom to go about the city they are in for a stroll, and they do not have the freedom to pack their bag and go home, and they do not have the freedom to bargain for a pay raise. And this is modern slavery. And definitely it's um, it will leave mo- much more scars. And we don't know when it will be um, the end of these scars. And, um, and until then, we all need to try to find a way and um, to deal with these issues. And I would like to ask for... Uyghur women outside of China, what do you think um, is the impact of these crises on them? In what ways do women carry the weight of the crisis with them? The impact of this crisis on the entire Uyghur community in diaspora, including myself, is simply beyond measure. We suffer from collective psychological stress and mental illness that are the results of hearing family members, neighbors, friends, and former colleagues disappear into thin air. 
and prominent individuals and academics, often people whom we regarded as the pillar of our society and upholder of our culture and traditions, are imprisoned indefinitely. Children whose parents thrown into camps left under the state care in orphanages alienated from their language and culture, but most importantly from their community and effectively becoming the stolen generation of the 21st century. Young women being forced into marriage with Han men and in some parts of the Uyghur land, as we discussed earlier, there is credible evidence that women are put through coerced sterilization. Even those who are not taken into camps cannot be considered free as they are under constant surveillance in every aspect of their lives. Living in fear is an emotionally traumatizing and dehumanizing apartheid social reality. And even worse, they need to actively engage in the state's assimilationist program to demonstrate compliance. Uyghurs in diaspora suffer collectively not only because nearly every single person knows someone who has disappeared, but also because everyone is keenly aware of the consequences of such large-scale cultural genocide policies. While those who have chosen to bravely speak up live under constant fear of potential repercussions that might put their loved ones back home in harm's way, those who have remained silent do so exactly for the same reason. The entire community experiences survivor's guilt, which is quite normal. Uh, Furthermore, physical and emotional detachment from family back home with the possibility that they might not be able to see their loved ones in their lifetime is a continuing and tremendous burden that everyone has to carry. But I think for both men and women, another big challenge is the issue of mental health support. Many Uyghurs, especially the older generation, struggle with communication in the official language of their adopted country. For some, the financial implication to seek mental health support is too significant. But most importantly, it is very difficult to find culturally appropriate mental health services. I myself have experienced this frustration multiple times. There is also the stigma attached to, to seeking mental health support and My observation is that Uyghur men are much more reluctant than women to take this step. Yeah, that's true. And um, we have never had the chance to fully understand uh, what kind of mental um, illness that people can um, experience in their lives and then what kind of mental health that we can um, seek for. A lot of people just uh, choose to, to stay at home with their problems and it, it's becoming a more and more obvious in in Uyghur diaspora which is under like tremendous amount of um, stress um, I want to thank you for your time today and your incredibly insightful and important thoughts on these issues I would like to close by asking you about the concept of control it can sometimes feel like there are many forces both both inside and outside of the Uyghur community that are trying to control Uyghur women. Why do you think that is? And what do you think the impact is? First of all, I think it is very important to remember how gender issues should be situated and critiqued in and outside the Uyghur community. Gender inequality faced by Uyghur women should not be isolated as a phenomenon defined by culture or religion. Gender inequality and violence against women are a universal problem. Of course, toxic masculinity and patriarchal power structure are some important elements defining gender relations in the Uyghur society. I can't help but think of two of the most commonly used Uyghur proverbs that quite aptly eludicate gender relations. Er yeryem huda, which means a man is half god, and erni er kiran ayel, erni yer kiramu ayel. That is, it is a woman who makes a man man, and it is also a woman who disgraces a man. The first one clearly demonstrates a man's only second to God, and even divine status and authority, which is blasphemous. And the second one, insinuating that both the success 
and failure, or even the bedraggled look of a husband, is the result of a wife who failed to take her gender role in the household seriously or simply failed to comply with her defined role. One of the outside forces are, of course, the Chinese state and the Chinese social media, who continue to stereotype Uyghur women as the beautiful, exotic other ready to be taken on by Han Chinese men, or the oppressed other by Uyghur culture and society who need to be saved by the paternalistic Chinese state and by adopting superior Chinese culture, very orientalist and colonialist in nature. In Uyghur homeland, the current crisis renders no space or possibility to voice dis discontent. But I don't think Uyghur women have lost all the agency in expressing themselves, especially on social media such as TikTok. There are many young women who are finding niches to survive and express themselves as proud Uyghurs with autonomy. Other forces, I guess, would be the Islamophobic attitudes in and outside China and those in the radical left clique, such as some of the contributors to Grey Zone who are massive sympathizers of Chinese government and who try hard to convince the world that Uyghur suffering, including that of women's, are some made-up stories by anti-Chinese Western forces led by American government. When brave Uyghur women speak up about their experiences, these groups often attempt to discredit them and silence them. But all in all, Uyghur women's positions should not be delineated through the lenses of patriarchy, religion, the Chinese state, or political ideologies. Uyghur women should define their own role, make their authentic voice heard, and their lived experiences recognized. Uyghur women are certainly capable of this throughout history. For example, women in Khulja from the northern part of Uyghur homeland rallied at International Women's Day as early as 1918, wearing long headscarves hand in hand. This is six years ahead of the first such rally that took place in China proper in the city of Guangzhou in 1924. In the early 20th century, Uyghur women and their counterparts from other Turkic-speaking communities actively participated in the Islamic modernization movement known as Jadidism. One of the key notions of this reformist movement was that in order for society to progress, the issue of gender inequality should be tackled and secular education for women should be promoted. Let's remember that this predates the CCP's agenda by well over three decades. In 1990s and the first decade of the 21st century, prominent Uyghur women formed civil societies called Benevolent Mothers Societies, and they devoted themselves to the education of girls and the underprivileged. Although not entirely progressive, they still championed for gender equality and women's rights to some extent. In the Uyghur homeland, women are rendered voiceless through the state's ironclad rule and assimilationist approach, and through the repression towards expression of feminist ideals across China more generally. But I am still hopeful that Uyghur women in diaspora will have their voices heard and lived experiences acknowledged by fighting against racism, whataboutism, and sexism in general, but also through their struggle for gender equality within Uyghur community. And this cannot be achieved without their male counterparts joining in the fight. You're... Uh... That's a, such a strong statement. Yeah, we really need a male counterpart to be join, joining us and fight against all the schisms. And um, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your research. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you to the guest today for um, very bravely sharing both her research and her personal experience and her insight into this very important topic that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, e like I said earlier, it's not easy for somebody sort of outside of this experience to sort of gain access to. So I want to say thank you to our guests. And I also want to say thank you to you. Mukadas. Thank you for always being the, the, really great listener and um encouraging for people to for, for actually for me to share this kind of stories and um i think i'm also i want to thank uh, our guest and um uh, and also i hope that this conversation 
would be the starting point of more um, more conversation about gender equality and also um, LGBTQ um, community in Uyghur Uyghur society because there have never been um, discussions about um, this community and their their fear and the industri- in, like injustice that they're facing as well because of some kind of uh, traditional ideas and um, I think um, this will open up um, some conversations within the um, diaspora uh, but also help those people to express themselves and find platforms to share their stories as well um, I, I can't wait to to hear more stories about um women and um, how they cope with um, inequality and also, of course, LGBTQ communities from Uyghur uh, diaspora. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll hear more stories like that in next episodes. So until then, thanks everyone for listening and we will see you next time. See you next time. Uyghur Stories is hosted by Muqaddas Mejid and John Baer. It is produced by The New Wild. Our audio engineer is Hashad. Our theme music was also composed by Hashad. Uyghur Stories is made possible with the support from the U.S. Embassy in Paris. For more information, please visit us online at www.uyghurstories.com. That is www.weghurstories.com. Of course, you can find us on Instagram at Uyghur Stories. <laughs>